Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started today. Welcome to the 2021 Women in Leadership panel. Thanks so much for your time today and certainly appreciate the opportunity to moderate this panel. My name is Molly Gurjan and I'm a current junior studying agribusiness at Purdue University. And this afternoon, we will learn about how each panelist has navigated their career path, the challenges they have faced, the feats they have overcome, and the lessons learned along the way. And today, I am just so thrilled to be joined by a great group of women serving the food and agricultural industry, consisting of Beth Archer, Executive Director of Agri Institute. Thank you, Beth. Kenda Ressler Friend, President and Founder at KRF Public Relations. Melissa Reckway, Senior Director of Talent at Agronovis, Indiana. And Julia Wickard, Assistant Commissioner and Agricultural Liaison at the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. So we're super grateful for their time uh, this afternoon um, and we're just excited for the opportunity to speak with them as well. So uh, could you each give us a brief ex explanation of your career path and what led you to your current position and title? And Beth, we're gonna go ahead and start with you. That's the bad part about having an A as your last name, right? <laughs> I'm honored to be here, y'all, and it's good to see some familiar faces on the screen. And thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this. Um, my background is not in agriculture originally. I was raised on a farm, so I have some of that background in my, in my background. But I actually um, was educated across the street in uh, the CFS school as a home economics educator and taught high school home economics for um, for several years and worked in the Department of Agriculture or Department of Education for a while and then transferred into the ag sector um, and have been at Agra Institute for <clears throat> 30 plus years now that just seems like an unreal number to me because I'm sure I just started yesterday. Um, but I've had the opportunity to direct the Indiana Ag Leadership Program and honestly my, my true passion from the very beginning has been about helping individuals, whether they be high school students or now adults, um, be the best they can be. So what I can do to help support their growth, their, their um, confidence, whatever it is to help them be successful. And so that's where my passion comes from and, and why I'm so honored to have served where I have for um, 150 years. <laughs> Just teasing. <laughs> Great, Beth. Thank you so much. Kenda, do you wanna share a little bit about uh, your career path and what led you to where you are today? Can that, we can't hear you. I think you're muted still. So. Okay, the whole, whoops. All right, let's go technology. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just like to remind you all that when I was at Purdue, email didn't exist. Okay. So <laughs> the fact that I'm zooming all these years later, give me, it's uh, interesting. Well, great to be with you all here today and wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And really my career is Mark Russell's fault. So let's just blame him straight up because it was, oh, he's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, Dr. Russell called me when I was a sophomore in high school and told me I had won a horse from Bob Evans. And so I got this great 4-H trip and I learned of a career called public relations. I'm like, what is that? So I went home from that trip and called the extension office and said, hey, does Purdue do this thing called public relations? And lo and behold, they did. So Beth, like you, I started on the other side of the street. My bachelor's was in public relations. And then I was having so much fun. I just stayed on campus and worked for Ag Communications and the Alumni Association and got my master's on the ag side of the street in extension education with a communication focus. So I really thought I was gonna be an extension educator. And then a Purdue connection helped me get an interview at a PR firm in New Jersey. And I was hired on the spot. And that was in 1991. Ah. So anyway, I've been at PR firms for about the first 10 years of my career. Then I was missing Purdue basketball, quite honestly. So I wanted to move back to Indiana. And I got a job at Dow AgriSciences and was there for about 20 years, which also seems really long. And I had the pleasure of being able to retire from there in uh, February of 2019. And I started my own company. So that's my path. And my clients today are 
agricultural and a real good mix. And my, my rule is I only work with people I like on things I believe in. So I'm in a very, very blessed spot right now. Great. Thank you so much, Kenda, for sharing. Uh, Melissa, you want to go next? Sure, I'd be happy to. I'm Melissa Ruckaway. I'm Senior Director of Talent at Agrinovis, as Molly said. And my career path has been really varied. Um, I am an ag education graduate from Purdue University and ended up teaching for one year and then just started um, looking at a lot of different opportunities. Um, I was Executive Director of Indiana FFA Association, um, Director of Career and Technical Ed for the state, Deputy Director of ISDA, um, had eight years of banking in there, ended up being Vice President of a bank. Um, so you might think, gee, can she keep a job? Well, I actually can, but I probably would say my life path or career path has really been navigated by a lot of moves and also um, decisions based on family, which I think is important to recognize that as women leaders, we have to make those choices sometimes. So um, right now I'm with Agrinovis and I'm loving it. I, when you hear Senior Director of Talent, you might think HR. That's not my role. What I'm doing is trying to find talent programs that can help strengthen the ag bioscience pipeline. So through those different things that I've done through government, nonprofits, and through finance, I think they've been a really great combination to get me to this point to help build those talent programs and, and continue to connect with students, um, not only at the high school level, but also college level as well. Great, thanks so much, Melissa. Julia, you wanna finish this out? Yes, my last name's a W, so I always go last, unlike Beth who goes first. So, um, <laughs> Good afternoon, Purdue Ag. It's great to be with you. Um, I knew from early on that I was going to attend Purdue University. Um, I knew I wanted to study agriculture, but I also had a passion for public service and public affairs. And so actually I have a degree in ag communications from Purdue as well as um, political science. So I worked in, and served kind of both sides of State Street. So I think there's some common themes there. I can tell you which side I really enjoyed the best and where I really connected. And that was the South side of State Street. Um, but my career has been varied as well. Um, yeah, certainly during college, um, did a series of internships, probably before internships were cool back in that last century. Um, and um, then kind of catapulting forward, um, I've worked, um, in private and the public sector. I started my career in state government in the office of the Commissioner of Agriculture, which predates um, the State Department of Agriculture's name, but I was the deputy there. I then had an opportunity to serve the Indiana Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts as the first, I guess, female uh, executive director in that role. And then um, came back to state government, served a, a while longer and, um, Indiana Farm Bureau reached out. Um, my passions were kind of natural resources and conservation and stewardship. And so went to Indiana Farm Bureau. I live on our Angus cattle family farm in Hancock County. So I, I really thought the next job was probably where I was gonna stay my career when the Indiana Beef Cattle Association contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in interviewing. And just a quick story, I'll never forget um, I was the first female executive vice president for Indiana Beef, but I'll never forget the interview. There were 26 white male men um, sitting around the table doing the interview. I'll never forget that in my entire life. Was hired, really thought that was the dream job um, because I was able to, to work in agriculture, work and serve beef producers, work with the legislature and Congress. And then uh, I received a call uh, one afternoon from um, the Department of Presidential Personnel in, in the White House and was asked if I'd be interested in the state executive director role for the Farm Service Agency. And I guess you get a call like that and you probably shouldn't say no. And so served eight years um, in that role and then um, elections have consequences, right? And so I'm a consequence of an election, but um, I think because of so many people on this call and so many friends on both sides of the aisle in my career. Um, I have landed at the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, um, still in public service, which is where my passion really is. So um, it's great to be with all of you today. And I really appreciate Purdue Ag putting this together. 
Great, thank you so much, Julia. And thanks all to our panelists for sharing uh, your background and where you've been, really great diversity of experiences and excited uh, to share more today with folks online. So uh, next question just for all of our panelists here is, what is or um, has been the driving force uh, behind your career aspirations and achievements? What has really led you to where you are today? That you know, driving force, whether that's um, externally or internally, wherever you're at. Let's go to somebody. I, I won't start. Let you guys, Kenda or Melissa. I'll chime you? in. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I think you know, as I was thinking through the questions, and again, not to be all 4 H E, but making the best better has always been something that has kind of driven me. And okay, I really like blue ribbons. You all know me that know me. No, that's true. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but just trying to be better, you know, learning something new, trying something new that just, and then you try to instill that in your kids. And then to Melissa's point, then you mix in the practical with all that glorious things like pensions and insurance and not having to travel. So I think that whole mix of things, but just trying to, to be the best I can be and just keep learning. For me, I would say um, I'm, I'm thinking back through job changes. And I think what has been my driving force is that answering that call to serve. Um, there's very few jobs that I changed that were, wasn't, um, the connection didn't happen because somebody called me and said, you know, are you, we have this big problem or this big project that we want you to take on. And I get really excited about the opportunity to, to help them and to answer that call. So maybe where I am, I feel like I've gotten things um, running appropriately and I feel good about it. And it's not that I was unhappy with that job, but that opportunity to answer a call to serve. I've done a lot of um, work in government, a lot of work with nonprofits. And I just, I get um, a lot of energy off that opportunity to go in and see what I can do. And I think the other thing is um, just the work ethic. Like I, I like to work, um, maybe that's, that's a negative, but, but I think that's something that has really driven me um, is understanding that it's not gonna come easy and I'm gonna have to work at it. And I, I think the driving force for me is the Indiana farmer and production agriculture. You know, if with every role I've had, um, you know, I go home to the farm every night. I live on our homesteaded family farm. And so, you know, yes, I have to turn the hat around when I come to work. And, um, but I always try to remember why the work that I'm doing or my colleagues are doing is important. And really it's for American agriculture. And so um, I can't imagine another career um, you know, I can't imagine working in a different environment. Um, you know, the, the people on this call and thousands um, beyond this call are the reason why agriculture is home to me. And um, for me, that's why I continue to stay involved and engaged um, in this important industry. I think for me, it's always been about how I can help people be better. Um, so, you know, starting in my very early in my career, being a home economics teacher, the opportunity to help um, young people at high school age better their abilities, their skills, their knowledge, gain confidence to be strong leaders in their right. And the opportunity which, with each change to, to move into a role where I could be about helping people. Um, and that's really, you know, the bottom line where I think that's, that's dri driven me through, through all of it. And, and that transition from, more of a home economics career into the ag was very, very natural for the very reasons Julia mentioned. It just that knowing that the value agriculture brings to our society and brings to our economies and brings to our local communities um, is so critical and so foundational to all that that makes our country and our and our world strong. And to, to be a part of helping people who, who make that industry strong. Um, develop their leadership skills, develop their networks, develop their abilities to to serve in whatever roles they serve um, has has really been what gets me up in the morning, gets me excited, gets me excited about what I do each and every day. Great. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. I think some good tidbits there that we can all uh, take to use as our driving force um, and to provide motivation to us going forward. 
Um, next question for you all is, how do you embrace being a female in leadership? How do you earn respect um, when working with others um, by being a female in leadership? My simple answer is the same way a man does, be good at what you do. <laughs> I think we have to be careful in some of these situations to really think about leadership. And I, I guess, you know, and I, I'm curious to hear what everyone else has to say that really, you know, leadership standards, I don't think have a gender attribution. I think we all have our own style. But, uh, you know, I think really, the key is respect and being the kind of leader that people can respect. So that's kind of how I've embraced it and done it. But I'm curious what the others have to say. I think it's saying what you saying what you'll do and then doing what you'll say. And just having integrity through the process. And um following through not being you know not being too too above to do what everyone else that you're asking to do something that you're not willing to do it yourself and so you know um and i've learned from leaders that haven't done that and so that's kind of helped shape my philosophy is that um jump in um, get your feet dirty and uh, be involved so and and follow through I uh, I couldn't second or echo what what both Ken and Julia have said any more predominantly. I think those are incredibly important things to keep in mind. And I, you know, it is about integrity. It's about your character. It's about your reputation. It's about doing your very best always and being prepared. And then whether it's male or female, or whatever the skin color you will earn your right to be in whatever position of influence or position of, of uh, leadership that, that you're striving to achieve. Um, it, it's talent, it's using your talent, it's, it's recognizing your skills, it's honoring others that you work with by serving them that enables you to be successful in whatever role you pursue. I think they've nailed it. Um, there, there's not a lot to add. The only other thing that I think that we could focus on, because um, everything those three ladies said just sums it up, is is treating others. I mean, that basic golden rule, treating others the way you would want to be treated, I think can gain a lot of respect. Um, and, and I think it's required. Um, as a women, woman in leadership, you need to make sure that you are, um, to Julia's point, you know, doing what you say you're going to do, but I think that also goes beyond the task and it goes into the relationship with people. If you think you're a person that's, you know, going to be open to new ideas, um, you're not going to create conflict, you need to make sure that you're doing that um, and actually building those relationships. Great advice. Thank you all for sharing. Next question for you all um, speaks a little bit about some of the experiences that you all may have had. So what experiences have you had as a woman in your career that you believe might have gone differently if you were a man? Um, and how do you think those experiences have shaped your perspective and influenced your behaviors and leadership and working with others today? I guess I can start. I, I mentioned to you the, the very large interview I had um, I don't know if a man would have had that many other men in an interview. I can't answer that question, but it probably just helped me be more aware um, early in my career of questions that, you know, come your direction. And I think just answering the question, you know, and not shying from the question unless it's obviously inappropriate, but I have not had any issues with gender bias. Um, if anything, I can tell you that when I started my career, there was not a line in the bathroom when I go to a meeting, and now there's a line at the bathroom. So to me, that is speaking volumes <laughs> that you know we're doing something right about women in leadership and women getting engaged in tough conversations and policy decisions and um, being a part of the conversation and ultimately the decision-making process. So. Um, a couple of quirky things, but they are things that I've noticed um, over my career. So I've not experienced it in agriculture, but I did mention I had a stint of eight years within banking and, and it wasn't anything drastic, but what happened was with banking, um, a lot of the operational business happens on the golf course. I did not play golf. 
So all the men that ran the bank would go off on the golf course and play golf on a Friday afternoon or at an event. And there was actually a lot of business that took place. So instead of getting upset about that, because I was one of the few people left out, myself and another female, um, I just sat down with the bank president and explained, I know I don't play golf. I know a lot of important things happen. Why don't we meet every other week at this time? And I'm going to talk about what's operationally happening within the bank because I led all the operations. And I felt like if he didn't know what was happening, if I didn't have that one-on-one -on -one time with him, um, he was going to make decisions because he didn't understand what was occurring in my area. So instead of really getting upset about it, because honestly, I didn't want to learn to play golf. That was on me. Um, I, I found a solution. So I think it's going to happen. Um, I've not experienced it, like I said, not in agriculture, but I did experience it in banking. And instead of getting upset, I found a solution that actually worked to, to my benefit and also improved the relationship I had with that supervisor. Yeah, I couldn't. Well, first of all, I thought of the Taylor Swift song. So let's all just get that in our heads and have that song going now, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I really couldn't think of something that would have been different. I, you know, it happened to be a man boss at Purdue. So after Mark Russell got this party started, Steve Kane picked up the phone and got me that interview. So again, I don't really, you know, I really honestly, and, and maybe I'm lucky, right? I really could not think of anything that would have been different for me. See, I agree. I, you know, I, I've often thought about that question because you hear that, that 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 topic come up in a lot of different kinds of conversations. And and I've thought back over my career and I've never felt there was a time when I was allowed or not allowed to do some act of whatever requirement or whatever job responsibility or whatever opportunity I had in front of me. It didn't seem to be any inner, any gender bias related to that. So it's always been a little hard for me to sort of understand that. Melissa, I, you know, I haven't quite had some of the experiences you've had in that respect. I was the first me female director of the Ag Leadership Program. There were two men before me. When I looked at my counterparts, there are 33 plus programs like the Ag Leadership Program around the country. When I first started, yeah, I was, you know, one of two women that showed up for the, the gatherings of my counterparts. But I never felt like I was the token female, nor did I ever feel like there was any conscious discussion about, you know, why men or women might be in those roles. It just was the fact that for Indiana, I was the one that was selected to run the program. Um, and as time has gone on, you know, now there are fewer men in those roles. Is that because we have done some sort of gender shift intentionally? I don't think so. I really think it's just been an evolution of skills, talents being lifted up and, and seeking out particular roles. And perhaps maybe, perhaps maybe there has been more of a, a freedom, if you will, of, of, um, other women feeling more confident to take on those roles or feeling that their talent and their expertise had value in, in those roles. Um, but I don't necessarily feel that there's ever been a particular bias that I've experienced. Really appreciate uh, you all sharing your experiences. Interesting to hear how you've handled some of those situations if you've encountered them throughout. I just wanted to let the audience know that you all are welcome to put questions in the chat, um, either privately to me or to everyone in the chat if you have a question for our panelists this afternoon. And while we uh, let some of the questions roll in, have another question for you all here. Um, what habits would you recommend others to employ in order to gain skills in leadership or communication, teamwork, um, just other important professional skills to serve you well uh, in the workplace? So I'll start off with that, and, and I certainly won't have a complete list, but when I think about the kinds of actions that one employs in their roles, it's really not related to gender issues. It's about being prepared for, for the job. It's about setting your by heart high and, and creating high standards for yourself in, in terms of how you do your work, whatever that might be. It's about being an encourager of others. It's about um, pushing the limits for yourself and exposing yourself to new opportunities so that you can grow that, that 
bench strength, if you will, of your capacities and your abilities to take on new opportunities. Um, it's, it's about being transparent in those times when you feel inadequate about a particular skill or capacity and seeking out a mentor to get advice, to get um, training, to gain some new, new levels of expertise. Um, it, it, and it, is, it really comes back, you know, Kenda, you mentioned the, the improving ourselves and, and the 4-H motto, making the best better. It, you know, I, I think it's about always pushing yourself to make yourself better, always. And, and I'm still doing that today, even though I'm gray haired and, you know, way on the other side, I, I continue to seek ways to continue to improve and to get advice from others and to, um, to explore new ways to do things. So Beth ran through such a great list. I'm not sure Julia and Kenda and I will have much to add because that was an excellent list. The, the only thing that I would point out that um, I feel like I have not done as, as well as I could have, but that's also when I graduated from college, we did not have social media. We did not have email, like Kinda said, right. it was harder to stay connected, um, is really building that professional and personal network and staying in touch with them. Um, I, I think graduates today have this amazing network of people they're gonna be able to utilize throughout their entire career. And I think that's something that you need to um, continue. What you call it a habit, a routine, whatever you're doing that you're on LinkedIn, um, you're, you're making time to continue to connect with people. Those older people like myself and maybe the others on the panel, we had to start fresh with that. Um, maybe, I think I only started LinkedIn like a couple of years ago, a little late to the game, but I think keeping those connections and continuing to build connections is something that's always gonna push you forward. And this, and I'm, Melissa, I'm just gonna piggyback right on you there that it, this may not be a habit, but it is don't just work, right? Volunteer. I think, you know, I, a while, probably 10 or so years ago, I realized, gosh, my network is all in ag. So that's when I really started doing some other things like family, family promise. And so now I'm really passionate. And if you follow me on social media, you'll see the big night without a bed thing we're doing for homeless families. But you learn a lot from people in other aspects that are very different from your daily life. And of course, it's fun to talk about soybeans and this stuff. And people, of course, I'm who my buddies call for ag questions, right? But uh, anyway, but I think being, and in those opportunities, then you can kind of punch above your weight in that, like, for example, you can run an entire media campaign for a, for a not-for-profit and they're grateful, right? Something you may not have been able to do at your office or in whatever role, but just those, those outside the box things that really help you realize, you know, A, that you're, you know, how to, listen to other people and be a leader. But I think that kind of thing also keeps you balanced too. I'll just add, um, I think get involved. You know, whether you're a student at Purdue or you're a recent graduate or you're in the workforce, you know, whether it's, you know, outside of what you're accustomed to doing in your professional life or not, just get involved. You know, all of, if, if, if your passion is agriculture like it is mine, Find an organization that you have passion about. They're always looking for volunteer leaders. They're looking for people that have um, energy and new ideas, um, whether it's the commodity organizations or Indiana Farm Bureau. Um, so I encourage you there. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, there are some graduates of the Agri Institute Ag Leadership Program on this call, but there's a lot of people that are not. And so if you have not heard about Agri Institute, and if you have not heard about the Ag Leadership Program, um, Beth Archer is your lady. She is the executive director. Um, we're getting ready to start recruitment for class 20. Um, so look into that opportunity to um, continue to build your network and to develop your leadership skills. So the Ag Leadership Program is a two-year program that for people in agriculture, you really need to be a part of. And I didn't have to pay her a dime to say that. How about that? That's what's having a good board chairman is all about. And, and I'm, I'll give you a big right on. I, I'm fortunate to say that all three of these ladies are, have been a part of our program and are what helped make this program really strong. But, you know, I was going to piggyback a little bit on what Julia, Melissa, and, and Kenda said to circle back in just... Um, 
You know, when you have an opportunity to do something you've never done before because you volunteered for a particular organization that may be outside of your circle, it gives you a chance to grow your skills in a way, sort of in a safe space, if you will, sometimes, to really expand your depth of skills and knowledge and talent. And so, you know, stepping up and doing something nobody else will do or being brave enough to um, explore a new way of doing things or suggesting to an organization or a business that you're working with is a great way to set yourself apart and it gives you a chance to take some risks, try some things different. And that's not a bad not, not a bad piece to add to your portfolio. And you get to be the go-to for agriculture in all those organizations. Great, thank you. Well, I received a question on my end and wanted to share because I know Julie touched on it a little bit, but what professional organizations have you most enjoyed being involved with uh, during your career in agriculture? Agri-Institute. <laughs> yeah, Agri-Institute tops my list absolutely as well. I'm now trying to think of some others, right? So like uh, uh, NAMA, National, the Marketing Association, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. I mean, early in my career, that was, you know, I was president of Atlanta and blah, blah, blah. So lots of ways to be involved with other ad agency folks. And that was fun back in the day. But in terms of leadership and everything else that comes with Agri-Institute, and it really helps you know everybody, which is so key. I would encourage you to look at your local communities too. Sometimes we forget, we think about engaging in our very industry specific kinds of organizations. But when you think about the work that social organizations do in your local communities, um, economic development organizations do in your local communities, it's such a great platform to not only tell agriculture story, but to engage, to do the work, to show um, in, in sort of a real way, the value that agriculture brings to those communities, wherever those communities are, whether it's your, your church community or it's, you know, your, your, um, the place where you live or whether it's, you know, some other community that you're, you're involved with. Good point, Beth. Agree. It's good. I would say Agri Institute because I don't want to be the only one left out there since all three <laughs> ladies said that. But the other one um, that I think that surprised me is I serve as a trustee for Ivy Tech Central Indianapolis campus. And um, the Central Indianapolis campus does not have any agriculture programs, but yet they have an agriculture seat on their trustees board. And just the ability to, to help them see through that lens, um, there's probably 40% of our workforce in agriculture that's not gonna come from a traditional agriculture path. And getting the rest of that trustee board to understand that they need to continue to reach out to agriculture companies, even though they don't have agricultural programs has just been incredibly rewarding. So I think anytime you can be on a board or a committee or even just volunteering, like Kinda said, and you can feel that you're making that difference and you're impacting the industry, I, I think that's a win for yourself and also for the organization you're serving. Well, I'm not gonna let us go any further without also mentioning the incredible value of getting involved in Purdue Extension in your local communities and at the state level, whether it be PCARAT or your extension boards or volunteering as a 4-H leader. And I also am not gonna let us get very much further without talking about being involved in FFA in your local community or at the state level, whether it's volunteering to be a judge or volunteering to be an advisory committee or to be that, that technical expertise on, on a particular subject matter area. It's, those are really critical places to, to spend your time. Great. Thank you. Some great opportunities for us to stay connected to our community and get involved. Um, received another question here in the chat, um, but what institutional changes would you like to see in your ag field to support more gender equity? These might be related to policies, practices, or issues related to climate as well. Those are tough questions. <laughs> There's um, that. 
th- th- there is. That's, 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 you know, that's one of those conversations we dance around. It's almost like in some ways it's a little bit of an elephant in a room. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way at all. We're all trying to find our voice. We're trying to find the conversation and, and, um, you know, so I'm going to talk specifically about Agri Institute and our Indiana Ag Leadership Program. If you look at the graduates of this program, you're not going to find a lot of diversity. We have a lot of male, female gender diversity. But when you start looking at race and other other diversity factors, we're re- really weak. Um, and it's a challenge to us because we certainly don't want to not, or let me say, I don't want to mean the du- double negative thing here. Kendra, you're going to have to help me with my words. But um, we want to be open, embracing of all perspectives and all backgrounds and expertise. Um, but when you look at our pictures, then it's hard sometimes to relate to people who, who are graduates of our program because we don't have an Asian depth in our in our graduates we don't have a depth of african americans in of of our graduate base we don't have a depth of hispanics or let's continue to go on down that line and so i think the more we can support encourage um bring alongside individuals who have talent who have incredible depth of expertise who are bright individuals the more we can work to bring others alongside of us regardless of you know what their race their color their you know all of those things the more we can bring them alongside and lift them up and encourage them and um work alongside the stronger we're all going to be um those voices are incredibly important and you know, sometimes it's really just a matter of we don't do the right work of bringing them with us. And I'm not sure if I said that all politically correct. So if I in any way, shape or form offended somebody, I certainly didn't mean to, um, because I really come from a place that everybody has such incredible value. And it breaks my heart to think that someone would not feel welcomed or feel important in our conversations. Beth, I think you said it really well. So, so no worries there. You said that very well. Um, I don't think there's a policy thing. I think it's more of an individual thing um, that we all have to work extra hard to make sure that when there's an opportunity, we are making it aware to, to all organizations, all groups, um, job postings. We, we really struggle in agriculture to, to have a good diverse workforce. I think we're getting better, but we continue to struggle with that. Um, instead of just like posting the job, are we making the extra effort to make sure we're reaching all types of candidates, not just those that are looking at the postings? So I think it's just really a, an individual at your companies or um, personally with boards, organizations, your own friend network. Are you making that extra effort to make that a di- diversified experience or are you doing what is easy? And I think in the past, we've probably done what's easy because it's worked, but I think it's very visible now that it's just not good enough. And I As guess- I talked, oh, go ahead, Julia. No, go ahead, Kenda. No, I'm, I'm still forming my thoughts, so you go. Well, I was just gonna maybe go a little different direction and talk about diversity within issues in agriculture. Mm-hmm. You know, I think many times we get pretty siloed in the things that we're comfortable about. And we tend to not um, take ourselves into those uncomfortable places where we have a lot of success, you know, to me, you know, when I think about the old soil conservation days of T by 2000, um, we were sequestering carbon then. That is a climate change conversation that is positive for agriculture and are things that we are not talking about. And, you know, I, I've seen more conversation happen in the last few years, but I think as we have new generations of leaders be more comfortable about talking about those issues that um, have been farther removed from kind of the vernacular of um, kind of traditional ag. I think that is the importance of diversity in our industry as well. 
in addition to the people, it's also the policies and it's the it's the programs that we're going to be administering in the future. And we shouldn't be running from those issues. To me, we need to embrace them because we have a lot of really great things to talk about about those. And I was just kind of going to go a little bit of a completely different direction in that the pandemic has been a huge reset button. As I've seen for many of my clients, all of a sudden, it really doesn't matter where you live if you're good at what you do. So I think maybe this most bizarre and awful of years has maybe given us all a chance to say, oh, everybody was at home. Everybody is, you know, doing, you know, trying to get the job done and stay connected. And we all had to really, you know, I think I forget who said it earlier, you know, stay in touch with your network. You really had to do that. So I think that, you know, all of us can take a minute and say, how can I work different and work better? And to everything else, everyone said, be inclusive and look for new ideas. I'm going to piggyback a little bit more on what Julia said too. You know, um, at the risk of sounding a little disparaging um, against our ag industry, we do have a tendency from time to time to be divisive within our own circles. And as you think about the, the bench strength, if you will, of agriculture and how we've expanded and grown into a lot of new areas of production practices, uh, views on how certain kinds of issues are addressed, um, it's incredible to think about all the strength we have, but from time to time, we get a little siloed in our views. Um, and, you know, I think the opportunity for us to, to listen, to hear, really hear, not just hear words, but really hear um, different views and perspectives allows us to, um, I don't know, just be incredibly uh, revolutionary, if I, if I can use that strong of a word, in how we continue to grow and advance our agricultural industry. And it's going to be different. There are going to be a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. That doesn't mean bad. It just means different. And how do we continue to support those growths? Maybe we don't necessarily agree with them, but we, we agree with the fact there's an opportunity for that to exist. Okay, Melissa, should I say it or you? We have to quote Ted McKinney, agriculture, big tent, big tent. I tried so hard not to use those words, but thank you. <laughs> Julie, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think we all have used the term, you know, if farmers are the original stewards and in this day and age of trying to connect the consumer with the farmer, um, you know, it's really our time to kind of get out of that silo mentality and talk about the things that are happening on the farm. And we need educators to help with that. We need communicators to help. We need economists. And so, you know, for the people on this call and, and those that will be listening afterwards, um, you know, to me, there's a place for everybody to help kind of share that that message that is so unique to our industry so great thank you all for sharing another question here in the chat states how could purdue agriculture partner with your organizations to truly make a difference and make our programs more inclusive and in and those uncomfortable for some of us ways So I, I guess I can, um, sorry, Melissa. No, um, I, I would say that maybe I make people uncomfortable here at IDEM by including agriculture into a lot of conversations because, um, you know, agriculture really doesn't, um, although agriculture is a big piece of the environment, it's sometimes not flipped the other way. And so in my role as the agricultural liaison, it's my job every day to reach out to Dean Plout and her staff and to the state chemist office and to the state department of agriculture and others to help bridge and make those connections. Uh, we recently did a, um, a spill prevention webinar and you know, IDEM was you know, blown away by the network that we were able to put together on that program because we had so many partners that were willing to step up. And that's the unique thing about ag is, we figure out how to work together. And so 
um, I think having Purdue Extension, having Purdue University um, in our land grant involved in each of our individual conversations are something that that I think I've, I've brought to IDEM and hopefully beyond me, they will remember that Purdue Ag needs to be a part of those conversations when we're talking about environmental policy decisions that affect um, Indiana's first industry, and that being agriculture. So I think one of the things to always remember, and it goes right in with what Julia was saying, is communication. Um, Beth mentioned silo. She was talking about like different parts of agriculture being siloed. Well, each organization within agriculture does a number of different programs. And sometimes those programs become really siloed and we're doing a lot of great work that we could do even better if we were doing it together. Um, so I think that communication between the different organizations and with Purdue, and then also um, with that communication is awareness. Awareness and willingness to merge programs when it makes sense, to retire a program and let another one succeed when it makes sense, and, and just really relying on those partners so that we're looking at the outcomes and not just doing a program to do it. I'm hesitating because I'm not sure if Kenda is going to speak next or whatever. We're, we're, we're doing that that uh, that juggling act here, but you know, one of the things I will say from Agri Institute's perspective is we have been so blessed from our very beginning of creation to have had a strong partnership with Purdue, um, both in the way the program was administered, but also in in the talent that we're able to access for programming. And um, you know, I couldn't praise enough our work with Purdue and, and Dean Plout and, and her support and it's, you know, each team preceding her um, has been very supportive of our work and we continue to look for ways that we can um, lift up the great work that that is being done at Purdue and then also to provide students who come from Purdue Ag as they progress through their careers, the opportunity to participate in, in yet another program that will extend their their uh, leadership capacities. And so, I don't know, um, Dr. Russell, if that was the answer to your to question or not, but I, I've always valued the strong relationship and the, the incredible strength that Purdue offers. You know, and, and I, I, I share this story a lot. We sometimes wonder, you know, what's, what's, uh, what's the rest of the world think about what we're doing here in Indiana? And every single ag leadership program I have taken to a different part of the world as we meet with experts in that part, I don't care if it's South Africa or Costa Rica or um, Liberia, always per, the fact that we are from Indiana means that we're from Purdue. Now, there are some in our, in, that participate in our Ag Leadership Program who are not Purdue grads. Um, they sort of get wrapped into that, but always the reputation of Purdue Ag uh, across the world is held in the utmost respect. And that comes from the strength and the depth of capacities that, that's represented by faculty on, at, at Purdue and the students who come from the, the School of Ag at Purdue. And I'll just add one thought of continue to tell the story. And I, you see my organization, I'm, I'm kind of a shop of one, but I am the PTO president of a high school of 4,000 kids here on the north side of Indianapolis, one of the most diverse schools in Indiana. And really helping as a senior parent, oh my gosh, the senior year is horrific. So even in the best of situations, so helping kids understand the possibilities, understand that ag means so many things. And we've talked about this for decades, right, Julia, that, you know, ag is so much more than planting stuff, you know? So I think everybody on this call can continue to tell, you know, again, look at all the different careers represented here. So again, just keep letting folks know that ag has many, many ways it can go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I want to shift gears yes, now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. About what? No, you're good. You're good. What advice do you have for uh, younger females hoping to advance to leadership positions in the ag industry? What advice would you leave uh, to young Purdue ag female students hoping to make an impact in the ag industry as well? I guess if their students take advantage of those internships, um, 
build that network, get on LinkedIn if you're not, um, keep your social media uh, clean. Um, <laughs> and those are things that um, as employers are looked at, um, they may not be on that job application, but they are things that are reviewed um, outside of the, the, the final decision. So um, I know I tell my kids that all the time and, and uh, I think they're pretty good. I think they understand mom is serious. So, um, but I, I think also um, that network, I mean, you're doing it today. I mean, the people on this call are the ones that, you know, in leadership, you know, the world's run by those who show up. And to me, you've shown up today. Um, you've taken this seriously and uh, you want to kind of catapult your career and your um, experiences to that next level. So um, I can tell you, I want to, if, if there's a role I can help you with, I will. And I know my colleagues on the call will too, um, because we want to see great things happen with the future of this industry. As tried as this sound, the sky really is the limit. You know, I, I reflected, I don't know how many of you watched the presidential speech or President Biden's speech last night. Um, and, and this is not a political statement, so don't don't even let your minds go that space. But who was sitting behind the president? We had for the first time two female leaders sitting behind the president of the United States. Um, Dean Plout. Dean of the mo one of the most influential colleges of agriculture in the United States. Um, Julia Wickard at IDAM, Courtney Kingery at, at Soybean Association. You go around the block in just Indiana alone and look at the number of women who have um, achieved a lot in their careers and they have uh, assumed positions of influence. Um, some of them in very high profile positions, some of them in not so high profile positions, but nonetheless making a making a big impact. Um, so when I say the sky's the limit, I don't limit your ability to to step into those roles and prepare yourself for do that. And that means doing some things, job shadowing or, you know, working alongside, walking alongside alongside someone that you can learn something new from. Um, and Julia, you are so right. It's it's all about reputation and integrity, and that may be your social media, but conduct yourself um, wherever you are. Um, somebody is watching always, so never forget that. I would say probably take advantage of every opportunity. There are clubs, um, leadership programs. Uh, the opportunity just to interview for internships to practice your interview skills and learn more about those companies. Um, there's endless things you could do while you're there and make the most of every opportunity. And I would also say don't be afraid to take a class that you may not be very good at or you may not know much about. Um, the agriculture industry is turning more and more technology focused, um, data matters. Um, there are certain classes that I think it's really important that maybe they don't align with your major, but maybe it's great to take a class that's in, in data, a class that's in economics if you're not an economics major. Work with your academic advisors and figure out what that nice fit is that's not going to necessarily, you know, hit that requirement to get you completed, but it's going to add a piece of knowledge that maybe is going to be really beneficial to the future and help keep you current with how agriculture is changing. And I'll just chime in that, you know, and this is kind of a dichotomy, have a plan, but be flexible. You know, I think, you know, as I look at how every single opportunity I had came from a phone call or going through this door instead of that door, you know, I could have been the 4-H educator in Grant County for all these years had that, had I not gone to that interview. So I, again, I think I love that i what I'm seeing is, you know, students of today have great plans, but be open to the world. The great things just might come your way. Great. Oh, sorry. Is Julia here? I'm sorry. Oh, my my internet connection is unstable. I'm sorry about uh -oh. that. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Awesome. 
Well, um, next and final question for you all uh, right now is any books, podcasts, or other resources you might recommend to the audience related to leadership or other topics that are important to you? I've got one that I stumbled onto. And so again, I'm going to show my age here, but I grew up watching MASH, the TV show. And so Alan Alda is in his 80s, but his clear and vivid podcast, basically, I even wrote down its mission, helps you learn to connect better with others in every area of your life. And so that's, I always, I go up to my parents and it's a two hour drive so I can listen to two of his podcasts, but he's all about communicating and communicating about science, especially like if you listen to the one where he talked with Tony Fauci, unbelievable in terms of how he's able to communicate. So that one, you learn really interesting stuff, but you also hone your communication skills. I will um, share with you a couple of podcasts I listen to. I, I really enjoy TED Talks. Um, usually you can find a topic on there that you're working on and um, it kind of gives you a different perspective. And um, so I, I really appreciate that. I also, um, Dolly Parton's America, which is an older podcast. Um, there aren't a lot of um, uh, episodes, but there's some really good nuggets. And then I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about my daughter's podcast um, that she started during quarantine back um, last spring. A social person and was kind of struggling and we talked and I said, well, do something where you can connect with people. And so she started a podcast called Jordan's Joyous Jabber and um, where she talks about being vulnerable. She has some leadership components. Um, she's a senior in high school now and getting ready to graduate, but um, I'm proud of her. And I usually take several nuggets away from her episodes that she doesn't brief with me before Kenda. She doesn't even tell me what she's gonna talk about. <laughs> but um, usually there's something I'll take away from that. So I got to tell you about my daughters. <laughs> and it is really good. I'm going to take a different approach. I, I tend to not necessarily heavily recommend any particular book podcast. Um, what I tend to recommend is that you expose yourself to things that you're not used to listening to or reading. Um, Force yourself, encourage yourself, whatever word you want to use there, to, to, to explore maybe a topic that you're really uncomfortable with, or to listen to or to read an author that challenges your thinking a lot, uh, one who you may not even you know like, frankly. Um, but the more you expose yourself to different views, different perspectives, the more you begin to anchor on what values and perspectives you can you can line, align yourself with. So really kind of explore and ask other people, you know, what have you heard lately that really kind of unsettled you or kind of made you angry, maybe even. Um, and, and, and go listen or read that information so that at least you're exposed to it. I'm not asking you to like it. I'm just asking you to expose yourself to it and to broaden your perspective a lot. Um, so that's my challenge. And you know what? Read, 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 read. I don't care how you read it, but read. Read pol political um, opinions. Read um, newsy opinions. Become familiar with what's going on in the space around you. I have some recommendations that, and I, to best point, I think you need to just find whatever, you know, is the right fit for you, whether that's something to challenge you or whether it's something you're drawn to. Um, based on some of the conversations we've had today and some of the questions about, you know, women in the workforce, I, themes that I've noticed, um, confidence, especially um, young women graduating from Purdue, feeling how do they fit in the um, industry? What role should they take? I think a lot of that is confidence building. Um, the Confidence Code is a great book for young women to read. Um, I think also Brene Brown books are, are good for young women to read. Mm -hmm. um, and one, it sounds really silly. I, I read it years ago, probably, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years ago. It's um, Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. It is the simplest, easiest book. Um, I passed it through the whole bank. Almost every female read it there. And it was just talking about the unconscious things we do as females that kind of pigeonhole us into certain careers or certain positions within our careers that we are not even aware of. 
So it's kind of a, a fun, light read um, to make us aware of those things that we naturally do that are not wrong, but they're not necessarily things we want to do in the workforce. Awesome resources. Thank you all so much for sharing. Well, Beth, Kendra, Melissa, and Julia, this has just been such an uh, insightful conversation today. And just want to thank each of you for your time and wisdom shared with us this afternoon. It has just been so inspiring to learn from each of you. And to those who tuned in, thanks so much for listening and participating. Hope you all learned um, about how to embrace being a female leader in agriculture. This concludes our panel discussion today. So thanks so much and have a great day. Thanks. Sorry, I was kind of cash scrolling through the through the chat. So thank you again. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. And I, again, I'll share that recording with you on Monday. Perfect. Yes, thank you all very much again for doing this today. Great session. Happy to. Do you do these? Uh, what's the process for doing these in the future? Or is this the first one or is there a series? What's the plan moving forward? This is uh, the first one that I have coordinated. I think Mary Helen can speak a little bit more to uh, various leadership panel events, um, but we did want to focus a little bit more on, on women in leadership this time around. I think this is something we would like to continue in the future though. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I want to stay on your mailing list. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Molly, great job. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah, bravo. <laughs> Good job. Very well done, Molly. Yes. Thanks. So sorry, my internet connection like went out at the last moment. So I'm like, oh geez. <laughs> I'm not sure it would be a Zoom call if somebody's internet connection didn't go out. <laughs> it's it's technology. technology. It keeps us all humble or something, I think. Thank yeah. you again, girls. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. See Bye. ya. Have a good day. Good to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.